And once again, folks, for everyone who just stepped inside, uh, welcome, welcome. Just a reminder, folks, to please wear your mask while you're inside the planetarium dome. We are still inside. And uh, we're going to be in this room for the next 30 minutes or so. And uh, while we wait, folks, uh, just a heads up, we're going to get started with our planetarium show in about five minutes. We'll be getting started soon. But while we wait, we do have some space trivia questions up on the screen. Try to see how many of those questions you can get correct before the show starts. But again, folks, we'll be getting started in about five minutes.
All righty, everybody. It's about that time to start the last planetarium show here. Uh, I want to put away these space trivia questions up on the screen because now we're going to be transitioning into the unknown. Ooh. And uh, once again, everybody, welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. I'm very excited that everyone's here today on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. And uh, just really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I'm going to be your planetarium presenter for this show. And just a heads up, I'm a real person and I'm standing right behind you. I'm at the control booth. Hey, how's it going, everybody? It's nice to see you. But don't worry, don't hurt your necks. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. Everything that you see in this purple lighting is going to be one enormous screen, thanks to the help of six different projectors in our planetarium, which is going to give us that very immersive experience. And uh, just to let you know, folks, everything that you're going to see on this screen is backed by scientific data, evidence, peer review, and critique. Uh, we like to use the latest in science visualization software to give you that very immersive experience. And uh, just to let you know, folks, the show that we're doing here right now is different from all the other shows that we've done here in this planetarium today. Uh, this show is completely live. Uh, so pretty much what that means, you're going to hear my voice for the next 30 minutes. And this is a show that we call Tour of the Universe. So pretty much we're going to start pretty close to Earth, and we're going to zoom all the way out to the very edge of the known universe. And we'll be checking out some things along the way. So hopefully that sounds like a great time with everyone. And before we get started, I'm going to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page. We're going to have a great experience inside this planetarium. Uh, first off, there's no food or drinks allowed inside. Just because this is not your typical movie theater, we want to make sure this uh, place stays nice and clean for all the folks who are coming in today and in the future. So thank you for not snacking during the show, folks. Uh, this also includes no feetsies on the seatsies because, again, we might want to make sure that the seats stay clean for all of our guests. And the biggest of them all, folks, please, please wear your mask while you're inside this planetarium dome, even during the dark portions. And by wearing a mask, it does go over the nose because, again, we want to prevent things from spreading. So thank you so much. I can't stress that enough. And also, folks, uh, if you happen to have any 21st century gadgets like cell phones, smartwatches, laptops, <laughs> if you have them, now's the perfect time to turn them off, deactivate, and put them away for the next 30 minutes. Uh, these devices produce really bright white light that can be distracting for the folks sitting behind you in this dark environment. So we want to be courteous to all of our guests here in the planetarium. And also, folks, if you do need to leave the planetarium for any mo or for any reason, please make your way up the stairs. That's where the exits are going to be located uh, before, during, and after the show. So when in doubt, always make your way up the stairs, not down them. The exits are at the top. And lastly, folks, this show can be quite immersive. Uh, we have this 75-foot dome above us. So if at any moment during the show becomes too overwhelming, you become motion sensitive, there's a really easy, quick uh, solution for you to ground yourself. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big, deep breaths, your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling through space, at least not more than the usual. He he he. But otherwise, uh, that's all I have to say. Y'all ready for a fun planetarium show? Yeah. All right, everybody. Sit back, relax, and let's get started. Oh, okay. So it looks like we already drifted over to the nighttime of planet Earth. Uh, when I first started this show, we were flying in the daytime just above one of the oceans here. But uh, you can still see a remnant or a sliver of our planet Earth. It looks like it's about to head into nighttime. So it looks like sunset time around here, just below us. But folks, we're going to be starting again pretty close to Earth, uh, just above it at this really cool thing called the International Space Station. Now, the International Space Station, we also like to use an abbreviation known as the ISS. And essentially what this thing that we're looking at is a research facility that's orbiting around planet Earth. And this is between a, a collaboration between many nations across planet Earth to pretty much figure out what happens to things in space. For example, how does fire, water, or even growing plants in a low gravitational environment, how would they uh, work out here in space? So uh, this is one of the many things uh, that different types of science experiments that they conduct out here at the International Space Station. But folks, uh, just to let you know, it looks like we're really far away from planet Earth. That's probably because uh, we're inside this giant planetarium. But the International Space Station isn't too far away from our planet. It's only about 225 miles above the surface of the Earth. 225 miles, that's like a nice little family vacation with the family from San Francisco traveling to Santa Barbara, a nice little getaway with the family. 
But folks, uh, the International Space Station, not only is it only 225 miles above the Earth, this thing is going incredibly fast. It's going at a whopping 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes. And it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. And uh, not only that, folks, uh, this is the biggest thing uh, we humans have ever put into orbit around planet Earth. Now, again, it looks quite enormous on our screen, but this is only about the size of a football field. But it keeps getting bigger every year because they keep adding new compartments to the International Space Station. So uh, it continuously grows. And you can fit about anywhere from six to eight astronauts in here at a given time uh, with some leg room, although they would be living in these uh, modules right in the center of the ISS. And uh, just to let you know, folks, uh, this is as far as we put humans into space nowadays. So not too far away from planet Earth, 225 miles. That's not too far. But to travel out here, it gets quite costly. First off, you need to get yourself a rocket ship or build yourself a rocket ship. And then you need to get rocket fuel for that ship. And then you're going to need more rocket fuel and more rocket fuel. And then additionally, some more rocket fuel to get that rocket fuel off of the planet. Uh, just multiply that, but with five times more rocket fuel, you're going to need a lot of it. And then not only that, you're going to also have to bring all the technology equipment for life supports. Uh, you also need to bring food, water, and all the air you're going to be breathing while you're in space. So the bill gets quite costly quite rapidly. But for now, folks, we're going to start to slowly pull away from the International Space Station, and we'll see it slowly fade away to our uh, compared to our planet. And before we lose track of it, I want to put up a nice little... Uh, a nice orbit so we can keep track of the International Space Station as we continue zooming out into space. Hey, there we go. So yeah, it looks like we are hovering uh, just above the Atlantic Ocean. We can see Europe just down below. We can also see Africa as well. And uh, just to let you know, folks, uh, the program that we're using here right now to fly through the universe is a program called Open Space. Now, this is an open source program that where anybody can download it at home. Although, if you do download this, I would highly recommend a very uh, an up to date computer with a lot of processing power because uh, this software uses a lot of data points. It's pretty much uh, pulling information from geo satellites that are orbiting from planet Earth. So, pretty much the weather that we're seeing right now on our planet Earth. This is what the weather was looking like yesterday around noon. So this thing uh, uses a lot of information. So if you're going to download this, make sure you have a, a computer with a lot of uh, processing power. But uh, we're going to leave planet Earth for now because we still have a long ways to go to, uh, to the edge of the known universe. So we're going to be heading over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. Now, I do believe it is a new moon right now, so we're not going to be able to see much of the moon from our perspective. But again, we are in a planetarium, so I have some special abilities. So I want to give us, uh, I want to turn off the nighttime of the moon. And hey, there it is. See, I just love being in a planetarium. You can do so many cool things that you can't do in real life. <laughs> For example, we can observe the moon uh, this close. But again, we humans uh, have been to the moon before, folks. But that was quite a while ago. This was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo missions that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon. They got to conduct a lot of science experiments, and they also got to uh, have some fun, like play golf out here as well. But again, folks, that was the only brief presence of humans on another body in our solar system, and that was a little more than 50 years ago, so quite a while. But don't worry, NASA has a new space mission in the works that should be uh, taken off in about a year or two. And this new space mission uh, by NASA is called Artemis. So we had the Apollo missions uh, 50 years ago, and now we're going to have Artemis in the next year, which is pretty funny because Artemis is a sister to Apollo. Uh, I, I feel like someone's behind these clever word plays. I love it. But what's really cool about Artemis is that it's going to be sending the first woman to the moon exciting but not only that they're also going to be setting up uh setting up the first lunar base on the moon pretty much nasa's goal is to send humans to mars but before we send people to mars which is about a six to eight month voyage we need to figure out how exactly we're going to be living on a pretty much a celestial body so 
instead of sending them all the way over there, the moon is a much closer uh, place that we can figure this out. So only about a three days trip on a rocket ship. So uh, how exactly are humans going to live out here? What, what kind of uh, buildings would they be living in? Would they have to be wearing spacesuits all the time? So these are the kind of uh, things that they need to figure out if we want to live on the moon or on another a body in our solar system. So again, look out for any news about Artemis in the coming years. I'm very excited to see what happens. But folks, uh, when we look up at the moon here on Earth, it almost feels like you can reach out your arms and touch the moon. It feels so close, especially when the moon's uh, close to the horizon of our planet. But the moon's actually quite far away from us. It's about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. 240,000 miles, that's about a quarter of a million miles. Whew, that is really far away. But folks, uh, some of the folks in this planetary may have a car with that many miles on it. And if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop going 80 miles per hour. Uh, it would take you about, again, four months to travel that distance. Although I wouldn't recommend it. The roads out here are poorly maintained. Hee, hee, hee. But uh, from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities. So astronomers instead uh, use a more convenient measurement known as light speed. Now, folks, light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. So let's say you had a friend on Earth and they shined a laser at you on the moon. It would only take one and a half seconds for that laser to reach you. That is pretty fast, really fast, in fact. But for now, folks, we're going to leave our moon behind. So everybody say bye-bye, moon. We'll see you later. And now we're going to take a, a great leap into a realm of our own solar system, folks, because now we're going to watch the moon and the Earth as they slowly recede. And again, I want to put up our planet trails so we can spot them because out here, these objects pretty much disappear in the vastness of the distances in space. Now, folks, on our journey, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light because now we're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination, thanks to the help of computer models like Open Space, showing us the most accurate images and information available to us. And now we can see the nearest star to us coming to view, the sun, which is about 93 million miles away from the Earth. Whew, 93 million miles away, that is really far. But in terms of light speed, that's only about eight and a half minutes at the speed of light. Now, that's a really cool concept to keep in mind, folks, because let's say we're focusing on the sun, which we are right now. Uh, the sun em uh, emits sunlight, which takes about eight and a half minutes at the speed of light to travel that distance to reach the Earth, and then we get a nice uh, sunny day. But let's say the sun was to turn off all of a sudden. Well, we wouldn't know about it here on Earth for about eight and a half minutes because it would take that sunlight to take that long to travel that distance. And then all of a sudden on Earth, it would become nighttime. Now, this is uh, cool because this also works for really far away distances uh, out in space. For example, here on Earth, let's say we're looking at a star that's 10 light years away. But we're look uh, it took that long. It takes 10 years for that light to reach us here on Earth. So we're looking at that star as it looked like 10 years ago in the past pretty cool. It's kind of like when you're looking out into very uh, far distances in space, it's kind, of, it's kind of like you're looking back in time. But now that we have a nice bird's eye view of our solar system, let's take a, let's name the planets in it, shall we? So right in the middle, we have our sun, the biggest thing in our solar system. And then the closest planet to the sun, we have Mercury, then we have Venus, then Earth and Mars. These are the rocky terrestrial planets. These are places we can actually land a spacecraft on. Although some of them, I wouldn't want to send a spacecraft because the temperatures there are quite extreme. And then beyond Mars, we have this really cool thing known as the main asteroid belt. So let me bring up these asteroids. We're going to highlight all the asteroids in the asteroid belt. And here they are. Now, one common misconception about the asteroid belt, folks, is that in cartoons and movies, you tend to see people try to send spacecrafts through the asteroid belts, and then you would have to dodge and weave. Well, again, this is a common misconception. If you were to actually send a spacecraft through the asteroid belt, there's about a one in billion chance of your spacecraft getting hit by this asteroid, just because out here, there's just so much space. Uh, it's really easy just to fly right through the asteroid field. So it's not like in the movies or cartoons, unfortunately. 
But beyond the asteroid belt, we have the really big planets. We have the gas giants. We've got Jupiter, Saturn. So these are the big uh, gas Jovians. And then beyond them, we have the icy giants. We have Uranus, the funny one, and Neptune. And of course, we can also add the, the planetary trail of Pluto. So we're just bringing Pluto into the mix right now. We have Pluto at the very top of the screen, this nice light blue. And just to let you know, folks, Pluto is no longer considered a planet. It's now considered a dwarf planet as the year 2006. I know, Oz. But there's a really good reason to it. Uh, we humans here on Earth got really good about learning about the outer parts of our solar system, specifically the region beyond the orbit of Neptune, so everything beyond here. And pretty much what we found is that there's a lot of objects out here uh, that's pretty much orbiting along, alongside Pluto. Uh, in a region called the Kuiper Belts. And you're probably wondering to yourself, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that. Well, folks, this is the Kuiper Belt. Woo, that is a whole lot to look at. So again, in 2006, we learned that there was a lot of objects out here, more than there was about 400 objects out here, and some of them were way bigger than Pluto, so we couldn't call all this stuff planets. So all the astronomers across planet Earth came together, had a great big meeting. They had to figure out what exactly you need to be to be considered a planet. And one of the criteria is that you need to be so big and so massive that you push all the other objects out of your orbital path. And unfortunately for Pluto, it doesn't really do that. And not only that, it also orbits around its own moon. So this is one of the reasons why Pluto got kicked out of the planet club and is now considered a dwarf planet. But don't worry, folks, uh, Pluto's not the only dwarf planet out here. We've got quite a few. We've got Maki, Maki, Haumea, and uh, we also have Ceres in the main asteroid belt, a little bit closer to us. So it's kind of like Pluto said, hey, you kicked me out of the planet club. I'm going to start my own club, the dwarf planets. But I'm going to put away the Kuiper belt because that's a whole lot to look at. And now I'm going to be adding the spacecrafts that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system. So these are going to be all the trajectories in just a second. There we go. So again, these are the spacecrafts that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system. We've got Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2. And the latest of them, we have New Horizons, which uh, we can see did a quick flyby with Pluto right over here, just right in the front of our screen. So this happened in 2015, and pretty much New Horizons was traveling outside of our solar system. But before it left, it wanted to do take some really high definition images of Pluto because our photos of Pluto in the past weren't the best. They were pretty much pixelated photos. But thanks to that quick flyby, we got a whole heap of new information about Pluto. I could do a whole show about it, but unfortunately, we've got to go to the very edge of the known universe. So we're going to leave our solar system for now, folks, because now we're going to be heading into interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, folks, it's going to take us over four years at the speed of light to reach the next star system to us. So as we zoom on out, give us a nice little spin, and there it is. So uh, we are right at the center. That's our star system, and the next star system to us is going to be the one just a little bit down uh, south to the left. That's Alpha Centauri. That's four years at the speed of light to reach the next star system to us. So four years, that's about, that's about the same amount of time for a college education from freshman year to graduation. But folks, we're going to stop to consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our own solar system because now we're going to be stepping inside the radio sphere. <sighs> Whoa. So again, folks, we are now inside the radio sphere. And this represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting out from the Earth. So um, all the way across, that's about 180 uh, light years. Now, this first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television and radar signal, and then later the detonation of atomic weapons. Now, all these things are emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Now, humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. Since all these signals are electromagnetic, they are traveling at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radio sphere is always expanding at the rate of one light year per year, so is anybody out there listening? And folks, right now I'm going to be bringing up uh, these markers. 
These markers represent some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which has at least one or more planet orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. Our technology is not yet able to answer that question, but new generations of astronomical instruments are devoted for that so search. And uh, so far today, folks, we found more than 4,000 exoplanets uh, since we've launched our new space-based telescopes like Gaia, which its sole purpose is to find as many exoplanets as possible. So as we continue scanning more of the night sky, uh, the number of exoplanets we're going to be finding, that 4,000 number is going to be increasing. So we're going to be finding exoplanets left and right. In fact, we actually pointed our space space telescope Gaia in one direction. And if you can see at the very top of the screen, we can see a whole heap of exoplanets in just that direction that we pointed our space telescope. So very exciting. We'll be finding exoplanets left and right in the years to come. But the important point here, folks, is that Quite a few of these planetary systems within our 90 light year limit of our radio sphere could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there that's able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. But of course, planetary systems beyond our radio sphere more than 90 light years away have not heard from us yet, but eventually they will, as the radio sphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. But for now, folks, I'm going to put away our exoplanet markers. And I want to leave our radio sphere up there because that is a great reference point. As huge as uh, humanity's influence is in the nearby uh, universe, it is nothing compared to the Milky Way that we live in. So keep your eye on that radio sphere. Let's see if you can still see it as we zoom all the way out above our Milky Way. All right, can anybody see their house from here? He he he. <laughs> but now, folks, we are looking down at our Milky Way galaxy. And uh, just to give you an idea, our Milky Way galaxy is incredibly large. If you wanted to cross from one side to the other, it's going to take you about 130,000 years at the speed of light. Now, that is a very long road trip. Hopefully, you pack some snacks. But not only that, our Milky Way galaxy is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave our Milky Way, I do want to stress the shape of it. As we look at the Milky Way galaxy from a sideways perspective, you're going to notice that we live in a flat spiral disk. Now, this is going to come important later on the show because when we humans want to learn about our, uh, the universe, it's so much easier for us to point our telescopes and equipment galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, which has uh, planets, stars, gas, nebula, which obscures our view of the universe. So just keep that in mind, folks. We live in a nice flat spiral disk, and we like to point our equipment galactically north and galactically south instead of looking toward the plane of the Milky Way. But folks, the Milky Way galaxy is only one of many of hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. So now in this giant leap, uh, we're now going to see a view where each point of light represents not a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy, each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps even trillions of stars. Now, we live in a local galaxy group, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small. It also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda galaxy, only 2 million light years away, just next door. And we're heading right for it. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years. So mark your calendars. And folks, as we continue to uh, zoom out, you're going to start to notice that galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large groups and clusters. In fact, we can see a nice cluster right over here. This is the Virgo cluster. And we can see quite a few clusters all around us as we uh, take a nice spin around. But you're also going to notice that there's also great regions or voids that have very few galaxies where you don't see any galaxies in those regions. Just keep that in mind. The universe is not evenly distributed. Galaxies like to hang out in groups and like to stay away and leave empty voids. Uh, that'll come important in just a little bit as well. But folks, we've zoomed so far out that we are now looking at a picture that represents the 30,000 closest galaxies to us in a space over 300 million light years across. Woo. 
We've got to give thanks to a very amazing astronomer by the name of Dr. Brent Tolley, who worked at the University of Hawaii, who compiled this amazing galactic map that we're able to fly through uh, in this planetarium dome today. He also uh, got help from dozens of other astronomers working with him over decades of time, and they even color-coded the densest regions of galaxies in orange that we can see here in our planetarium dome. But folks, we still must continue on. And now we have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. So now we're about to see the large scale structure of the universe. There we go. And remember folks, every single point of light that you're now seeing is not a star. These are individual galaxies. Ooh, I feel really small now. And by the way, folks, the universe is not shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly. Remember when I just mentioned that we live in a flat spiral disk of our Milky Way galaxy? Well, if you were to line up our Milky Way galaxy, it would just line up just right there in the middle in a nice perfect line. So again, astronomers point their telescopes galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of our Milky Way, which obscures our view of the universe. But astronomers still wanted to make sure that there was galaxies through the plane of our Milky Way. So we have this nice little purple little survey uh, we can still see that they were able to find galaxies here, but not as far as the other ones when you look galactically north and south. But eventually that will change as our technology improves over the years. Once it does, we'll be able to look through the plane of our Milky Way and be able to map even the most distant galaxies in that region. So it's only a matter of time before these dark regions will be filled in. But we still need to continue on, folks. And now... We're going to be heading so far back. We're going to now not be looking at galaxies, but instead the brilliant core's essential nuclei of very young, very distant galaxies, uh, something known as the quasars. Now, quasars are short for quasi-stellar radio sources, and these are going to be all these orange dots that you're going to see on the outer part, the large-scale structure of the, of the universe. And essentially, these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So now we're going to look even uh, to a time before uh, quasars, before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we are about to approach the very edge of the known universe. And here we are. So folks, we have now approached the cosmic microwave background image. We also like to call this the CMB image. But pretty much all evidence indicates that the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And this picture that we're looking at is of a very baby universe only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And this is not a typical photo that we're looking at either, but a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color-coded, where the lighter areas correspond to the hottest, least dense regions, and the darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. These fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But eventually, they gave rise to that large-scale structure of the universe uh, that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how this happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us so we only have one direction left to go back home so let's find ourselves a nice entry point through all these quasars and galaxies and before we make our uh, return trip back to planet earth i've got to ask y'all to prepare yourself because this could possibly be the worst free falling dream ever <laughs> all righty folks let's begin our return trip back home and as we do so we're crossing an expanse of 13 billion light years we present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. Now, we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, I want to remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. 
Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to take a look in their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But it looks like we are just approaching our Milky Way galaxy, folks, and we're heading straight for that radio sphere, humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the cosmos. And now we are approaching our own star system. And of course, we are passing those spacecraft uh, travelers that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system and passing the Kuiper Belt region. And we're making our way to the third rock from the sun, our home world, our planet Earth, the only place humans have ever lived. And uh, as we make our final approach to planet Earth, folks, this is going to be the end of our tour of the universe show. I want to thank you so much for uh, stopping by and joining me this Wednesday afternoon. And uh, hopefully you've got a better perspective perspective of where we are in the universe but with that folks it looks like we made it back home to planet earth safe and sound and that's all i have for you today thank you so much everyone take care